I love the end of the year. I love turning the page to a new year. You've heard me talk about it before, but uh, I always think that if God's mercies are new every morning, as Scripture tells us, then surely His mercies are new every year. And yeah, thank you. And maybe if you are a candidate for new mercy this year, you should say amen, that I need God's new mercies this year, and I'm excited about what He's going to do in the year ahead. There's always this little lull after Christmas, and uh, maybe you have family around, or maybe you've shipped them off already, or uh, there's a little lull, and it, it's good because it gives time for observation, and it gives time to reflect on the year behind and the year ahead, and to look at what the victories were, and maybe what the defeats were, and what was good, and what you would like to change in the year ahead, and uh, it's always good to just remember to ask yourself the question, maybe not in what New Year's res- resolutions I'm going to set this year, what do I want to do, but to ask yourself the question, who do I want to become? And a year from now, when uh, we're all maybe gathered in this place again, and it's December 30th or 31st, uh, who's the person that you want to be on that day? And asking God to help you and to identify the person that you could become so that you can strive for that and so you can work to become that person. It's a, uh, we're, we're people that were created with goals and with dreams in our hearts and in our minds, and it's good to identify them and to pursue them. So I would challenge you in that way. Uh, By the way, my name is Josh, if we haven't met, and uh, one of the pastors on staff here. And uh, it's it's the end of a year, so it's a great time to recalibrate and to think about what's going on in the year ahead. If you have a Bible, I'm going to read one passage of Scripture uh, with you today, and it's in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. uh, And it says this, it says, For no matter how many promises God has made, They are yes. Come on. They are yes. Because you and I have been used to people who make lots of promises and keep a few of them. (laughs) Or make lots of promises but eventually disappoint. Or make lots of promises and, and don't follow through. But the Bible tells us no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Every, oh, come on, you're sleeping. It is 10.53, you are, it, you're in a warm room, and God's promises are yes. And, uh, and I wonder if you know them. I wonder if when, when you look at the promises of God, if there's something that you know and you understand. Thank you for, somebody's talking back. But I wonder if maybe sometimes we miss the promises of God, not because we don't want them, but we miss the promises of God because we don't know them. We don't understand who he's called us, what he's called us to be, what he's called us to do. There's a passage of scripture that says, these signs shall accompany those who believe. They will lay hands on sick people and they will become well. That is a promise of God. That's not a, a positive mental thinking that a human does. That's a promise of God. And, and if there's any discrepancy between God's promises and our purposes, or God's promises and what you and I actually do, the discrepancy has to do with our faith, and trusting in those promises, and leaning on them, for no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so, through Him, the amen is spoken to us, by us, to the glory of God. What does that mean? And so through him, because of Christ, you and I have the ability not to make the promises happen on our own, not to come up with our own promises, but you and I have the ability, because of Christ, to take the promises of God and partner with them and say, so be it. God said yes, and so I say, so be it, and it's spoken by us, partnering with the promises of God, to the glory of God. Not by our own work, not by our own ability, not because you and I are great promise keepers, but because God said yes. God looked at you and I and said, not only will I give you life, not only will I give you eternal life, but I will give you promises that will help you walk through this life. And they are yes and amen. Amen means so be it. And today is all about you and I partnering with the promises God has given us and saying so be it to those promises. I remember when I first came on staff at Evangel, and uh, I I was the young adults pastor, and I had the opportunity to preach every once in a while, and, you know, every other church that I've been at or opportunity I had to preach, it was one and done, you know, like one message, and then you're done, and you, you better do it to the best of your ability, because you only get one shot, where here I can get progressively better, you know, over the weekend. 
Uh, but but it, it was, you know, one message and then you're done. And I remember one of the first times preaching at Evangel and preaching three Sunday morning services back to back to back and being really excited about that. And, and it was awesome and it was fun and it was exhilarating and it was great to see God working in people's lives. And then I remember getting off the stage and somewhere in between here and my house, uh, like the adrenaline wore off. And my eyes got super heavy, and they started turning red, and I started feeling really tired. And uh, they call it the holy hangover that uh, pastors—sorry, I shouldn't have said that, but (laughs) that's—in the pastoral world, coming off of that adrenaline rush is—it's a real thing. And and it's why uh, pastors have to guard their lives on Sundays and Mondays, because you're coming off of the excitement of the weekend— And anyways, that's too much information, but I remember coming off of of that dynamic, exciting weekend and and feeling the rush of all those things happening, and then this crash starting to settle in, and I got home, and I, I, I walked over to my couch, and I didn't think about lunch. I didn't think about saying hi to any humans that were around me. I just walked over to my couch, laid down. I even, I didn't even watch football. I know, I know. It's serious. And, uh, and I walked over to the couch, laid down, and crashed, and just slept. And I remember at, at one point, all of a sudden, hearing my name, and at that time I was living with uh, a couple of roommates, I wasn't married yet, and one of my roommates said my name, and he said, Josh, Josh. And I'm like, what? You know, what, don't wake me from the dead right now, I'm tired. And I opened my eyes, and he was holding a plate with steak and potatoes. And he's like, you need to eat lunch. I was like, you are an angel. I never thought it before, but now you are definitely an angel <laughs> that God has given me. And, uh, and I remember him handing me a plate of food. And I have, I've told that story over and over because it left such an impression on me. And I've thought about that. Why some guy who took food that I didn't buy, food that I didn't pay for, food that I didn't prepare, food that I didn't deserve, and he prepared it, and he gave it to me. I mean, really, it's just throwing one extra steak on the grill, but he gave it to me. Why did it leave such an impression on my life in that moment? Why do I still have this, like, endearing feeling towards that person because of that one experience? And you know what it was? He met the exact need that I had at that moment. He, he saw that need that I had at that exact moment, and he met it. And I've realized as well that my affection for Jesus is very similar. That at the exact point of my need, Jesus met me. That at the place where I I couldn't achieve righteousness or I couldn't do enough good works on my own or I couldn't get myself out of my sin issue, Jesus met me right there. And it causes me to have an affection for him and a gratitude towards him. Aren't you so thankful that we serve a God who doesn't say, hey, once you get here, I will be your God and I I will be a part of your life. When, when, you know, maybe if you do enough good works, and if you pray the right prayers, and if you sound holy enough, and, and if you kind of get on my level, then I'll be your God, and you'll be my people. No, he's a God that says, hey, no matter where you are, I, I will, if, you're, if you feel like you're here, I will come for you there. I will step out of heaven, out of eternity, into your broken world, and come for you. Even if you think that, that your life is pretty well put together, you don't need God, he'll meet you in your arrogance. Even if, even if you think that that your life is so broken and filled with sin and, and you're in such a dark place that God could surely never reach you, he will come for you there. He's the God who meets us in exactly the place of our need. And this is what the promises of God are all about. The promises are not just good, happy thoughts. They are the things that we cling to that bring us through this life. The, thing that, the, the word of God that never fails. In our lives, it's the promises of God that you and I can lean on. They meet us in the point of our need. See, we all have a point of need, and maybe you've identified in the last year what your point of need was in 2017, and maybe you saw God just be totally faithful in that point of need. Or maybe you're coming into 2018, and and there's the unsettled thing in your heart. You know, maybe it was an awareness that you had a need at first. There's this need I I would really like God to meet, or I need God to meet. And that, that awareness turned into kind of a, a, a point of brokenness. Like you broke the skin a little bit, and it was no longer just an awareness that you had a need, but now it was kind of a, a, an open wound. And then God maybe still didn't work in that situation, or somebody wounded you again, and, uh, and then it became a sore. 
And then, and maybe the situation got worse and it became this open wound that you have in your life. Maybe in, in your heart or in your soul or in your emotions where you walk through something that has really wounded you. And you're saying, I need, I need God to meet me at that point of need. I wish that he would have met me a while back, but I'm still waiting for him to meet me. See, many times we go to people to try to get them to fill those needs, but broken people cannot meet the, the needs of other broken people. It's ultimately a Savior that comes to meet the needs of perfect man, born of God and of man, that comes to meet that need that you and I have. And maybe that's where you are today. You have this point of need that feels like devastation or Maybe it is called disease, or maybe it's a, a point of depravity, or maybe it's a sin in your life that's been an open wound, and you need God to meet you in the point of that need. See, there will be a point of need in the year ahead. There will also be things from 2017 that, that you're praying today, oh Jesus, please let it stay in 2017. I rebuke that thing from entering 2018. I, I want to I turn the page, leave that behind, and start new. And maybe there's things like that that you've identified in your life, that you want to turn the page and move on in the year ahead. See, what we also know is that there will be unmet challenges in the year ahead, things that you don't see coming right now that are going to challenge you. They're going to challenge your faith. They're going to challenge your life. They're going to challenge you emotionally or maybe physically. And they're, they're challenges that, that maybe you can't dictate out, you don't understand right now, but you know for certain that they're coming. See, we know that the Bible says that that the trials and difficulties of our life, that the rain falls on the righteous and the unrighteous. It doesn't matter how closely you serve God or how good you are or how, how crazy your life has been or how far from God you've been, all of us experience storms. All of us experience difficulty in our lives. There will be a point of need that you have in the year ahead, but can I just remind you that every time we look at Scripture, every time that we see devastation, it it is not there for the point of ending a people or shutting a people off or, or, or killing off any hope that you have. Every time that you and I walk through difficulty, it's not there to defeat us or to overcome us. Every time we walk through difficulty and devastation, it is simply there to serve as a sign that a deliverer is on his way. Come on, that's a new way of thinking. That my difficulty is not here to defeat me, my difficulty is here to reveal a deliverer to me. It's what the Israelites walk through when they're in Egypt. And they're under the oppression of the Egyptians and the weight of their oppression and slavery gets so heavy that they're crying out and God hears their groans. He hears their hurting. And so what does he do? He raises up a deliverer. And in the midst of devastation, and defeat, and hurt, and pain, God raises up a deliverer. It's the same with Jesus. We, we read in scripture in Isaiah that, that we, we didn't have a way to save ourselves, that we were like the blind groping along the wall when it came to saving ourselves from our own sin. We couldn't find our own way. We couldn't make our own way. And the, the word tells us that God was displeased, that there was no one to save them. So his own arm worked salvation for us. He sent his only son for you and I. See, even in the devastation of you and I not being able to to find forgiveness for our own sin in and of ourselves, even in the devastation of you and I not being able to relieve the guilt in our hearts from that sin, even in the devastation of you and I living this life thinking that when we die, they just put us in the ground and it's over, even in the devastation of that thinking, God says, no, I'll raise up a deliverer and his name is Jesus. And today, he says, no, your life won't end here. This life is actually the worst it's ever going to get. There's new life that's coming in eternity where, where you'll be in the presence of God. It's a, it's a better word. It's a deliver even in the devastation of your situation, of your sin, and of your guilt, and of the things that you've done. God says, don't live there. Pack your bags because I've sent a deliverer, and he's calling you out of those things. Every one of those people that was in the tank today, I said the same thing. When, when, you, when you are baptized in water, it's just symbolic of what God has already started on the inside. When we put you under the water, that old life is already buried in Christ. Just like Jesus went into the tomb, your old life is in the tomb. And God has resurrected or brought you out of the water. He's brought a new life. And it's because of the deliverer. Come on, woe to us if we become complacent and we hear the gospel of Jesus and we just become monotonous and mundane in it. And we forget that it is life and power for those that believe. That it is everything. 
that if we put a little bit of faith in action with these promises of God, that we can see Him do greater things than we think or imagine. That we can see Him even walk us through difficulty that we never thought that we could make it through. See, the devastation always signifies the entrance of a deliverer. It's even spoke about in Revelation when God says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, I will raise up a standard of my spirit against him. When devastation is coming, I will raise up a standard of my spirit and I will deliver you. And I'm just already declaring it. I've been saying it for weeks that 2018 is going to be a year of breakthrough. That it's going to be a year of breakthrough for you. It's going to be a year of breakthrough for me. It's going to be a year of breakthrough for my church. Did God speak that to me audibly? No, but it's in his word that he is a God of breakthrough and I'm taking it. And I'm counting on it. And I'm believing for it. And it might look one way or it might look another way, but all I know is that God is going to give us breakthrough. It might be one step forward or it might be complete breaking through every barrier that's come your way, but I'm going to take it. Every little bit of progress that God gives me is breakthrough. Every moment that I grow a little bit in my knowledge and my character and I become more like him, it is breakthrough. And I'm making this year all about breakthrough. See, I I began to pray this fall about what God would speak over my life and over the church in 2018. And I kept getting one word, and it was this word, deliver. I want to deliver, I want to deliver, I want to deliver. And I remember last year about this time saying, hey, God is speaking to our church that we're going to grow strong. And I I remember hearing God kind of speaking that to me and feeling like that's what God was leading us to. And I thought, that's great. I'm thinking of verses in Joshua, like everywhere that we set our foot, it's going to be ours. You know, everything we set our hand to is going to be successful. God is going to allow us to grow strong. It's going to be awesome. And then halfway through the year, I realized that God was going to grow us strong through breaking. That where the bone has been broken, it grows the strongest. That, that through breaking, God was going to make us strong. Why? Because in our brokenness, we find dependence on God. And when we find dependence on God, my grace is sufficient for you. The weak are made strong. See, it's, it's counterintuitive to what we would think when we look at the world or, or what we would naturally think God should do if he's going to make us strong, but it's in my brokenness and in my weakness that the grace of God is shown abundantly. And so even in my weakness, I I boast in the Lord, and I'm made strong in him. And I'm believing God that 2018 is going to be a year where he's going to deliver. Deliver, the word has a few different definitions. One means to set free or to liberate. A people that are delivered like the Israelites were from the Egyptians in the Old Testament. Another definition means uh, to give to another. You deliver a product. You, you give something to someone else. A, a final definition means that you come through or you deliver on your promise. You deliver on what you said that you would do. And there's many definitions to this word deliver, but there's a few promises that I'm holding on to. For my life and for our church in 2018, and I'm hoping that you will partner with me, and as we go into a a week of prayer and fasting in January, that that you will partner together and we will believe God, not just to bless our church, but to deliver people and to deliver on his promises and to allow us as a church to deliver on the promises that we've made as well. By the way, last week we asked you on Christmas weekend to give a, a special offering an extra gift to our community and to those that are in need. And last week, you gave $50,000 to help people in our community. So thank you for doing that. I don't want, I don't want Bismarck to just look at Evangel and say, wow, that's a great church in our community. I want them to say, that's a great church to our community. That's a church that's for our community. Go ahead. What does it mean to deliver and what am I specifically seeking God for this next year? Number one is that people will be delivered. That, that there's, there's many who have lived under a cloud of sin or, or a cloud of discouragement or fear or hopeless situations that have been holding people back. And my prayer this year is that people will be delivered from whatever it is that's holding them back. See, there's a promise in Scripture in Psalm 32.7. It's one of my favorite passages. It says, you are my hiding place. And can I just give you a freebie? What a, a thing it is to move from hiding from God to God actually being your hiding place. 
to him being the one that you run to, even in the difficult moment. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble, and you surround me with songs of deliverance. Can I just tell you today that it's okay if you need, be, if you need to be delivered? You know, back in the day, the people that needed delivered, they'd run to the front. They would let it be known that they needed God to intervene in their situation and because they were eager and expectant for God to move. They saw him move in their lives. And you and I need that eagerness again, that desire that I don't care what anybody else thinks. I need God to work in my life. And I'm, I'm going to believe him for it. I'm going to have faith in him that he's going to do it in my life. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue him for it. I'm going to pray into it. I'm believing people will be delivered from whatever has been holding them back. You are my hiding place. You protect me from trouble, and you surround me with songs of deliverance. It's okay to need delivered. Because why in the world would God sing songs of deliverance around people that don't need delivered? He does it because you and I need him to deliver us. You and I need him to, to take the thing that maybe is a wound in our hearts or take the thing that we cannot deliver ourselves from. We need him to take it and to deliver us from it. It's this whole idea of, of finding freedom and surrender and taking that thing, and I say it this way, that, that thing that you've been wearing around your neck, that weight, that burden that you've carried, and throwing it off and placing it at the feet of Jesus and just leaving it there. Because his burden is light and easy. And it's taking that burden and giving it to him. And I'm believing, God, that people will be delivered. I believe there's people in our church. I want to give a special shout out to Pastor Bryce for letting me raid the Kids Ministry Center closet this weekend. But I believe that there's people that maybe you're here and and you thought 2017 was going to be the year that you really launched forward. That, that God really shot you forward in, the, in maybe how you grew in him or the ministry he had for you or how effective you were going to be with people or whatever it was. And God was going to work in your life. And all that you felt in the last year is that you moved backwards. You felt like, man, my prayers aren't being answered. I don't, I don't even feel like God is near in my life. I, I don't see him. I, there, there's things that I trusted him with and I don't feel like he came through. Maybe the cloud over your heart and over your life today is discouragement. Or doubt that God could move again. But can I just remind you that there are times where God allows us to feel like we're moving backwards because he's developing godly character in us that will sustain us once he actually does launch us forward. That if he were to just answer that prayer, you wouldn't be ready to have the character to sustain that answer. You would take the glory for yourself or, or, or that answer to prayer would ruin you. But instead, God pulls you and I back and he develops character in our lives. But you know what? In a slingshot, when something is being pulled back, it's not game over. It's just preparation for something to be launched forward, for something to move forward. And maybe there's somebody here and you've been pulled back in the last year, and you need to know that in the year ahead, there's going to come a moment where the light switch flips on and God releases you forward into what he has for you. So do not despise small beginnings. Do not despise the character that God is building in your heart, even right now, through the difficulty or the devastation that you've been walking through. I'm believing that people will be delivered in the year ahead. I'm also believing that we will give to another, that our church will deliver on the promises that we've made to ourselves and the promises that we've made to our legacy. And this is just a blatant call from me to you saying, hey, let's rise up and let's do the things that God has called us to do as a church. Let's let's take reach trips and go to the nations. Let's support missionaries and being a salary-paying church for them. Let's reach more people in, in Bismarck, Mandan, and the surrounding regions. Let's, those of you that are watching online, let's start house churches. Let's start gathering people in our communities to watch church together. And let's start connect groups that will reach people in our community so it's no longer just families gathering around a computer or a TV screen, but it becomes missional. And you and I begin reaching our neighborhoods. See, many of the churches in our small community, I'm taking a a bunny path, but I'm going to rabbit hole, whatever it's called. Many of the churches in our small communities are aging or are are not reaching people, and we need pockets of missional believers to rise up and to go out and reach people in their communities. It's not just Bismarck that needs Jesus. It's every small town in North Dakota. 
It's every, every, every city in our region that doesn't have a life-giving church. Everybody in our region deserves to have a life-giving church that they can be a part of. And I'm believing that our church is going to work hard to deliver on the promises that we've made to ourselves. And, and I believe that uh, as a church that maybe we've gone through moments of God pulling us back, but Psalm 18, 19 says, He brought me forth. He brought me forth into a large and spacious place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Isn't that just crazy? Of all the things the Bible could say, he delivered me because I worked hard enough. He delivered me because he's God and he can just do that. He delivered me because it's really the right thing for the creator of the universe to do. You know, there's all these other things the Bible could say, but the Bible says he delivered me because he likes me. Because he delighted in me. God likes you way more than you like yourself. And for maybe some people that's hard to believe. (laughs) He rescued me. He delivered me. Not because I deserved it. But because he created me in his image. And he delights in me. When somebody needs to wake up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror, square in the eyes, and say, God delights in me today and every day. And you need to get it in your heart. You need to get whatever it is that you've been taught out of you that says God's mad or God's angry or God's rejected you or tossed you to the side or you're a disappointment to God and say, no, the promise, which is yes in Christ, said God delights in me. God delights in you. And you know what the crazy, grace-filled part of that is? He sees all of you. He sees the things that you hide from other people so that they will delight in you. And he still, even still delights in you. He even still cares about you. Why? Because of his magnificent ocean of grace that he gives to you and I. And his mercy in each one of our lives. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The last one is this, that God will deliver. We're believing God to deliver on all his promises in the year ahead. That God will deliver not just in and through our church, that people will not just be delivered, but we're believing God to deliver on all of the promises, on the promise that says stretch out the place of your tent pegs. Do something greater than what you did before. I'm, I'm thinking about the promise in Psalm 65, 11, that says you crown the year with your goodness. You crown the year with your goodness. I am going to put this on. I'm just warning you. You crown the year with your goodness. And you, maybe you say, well, Josh, what if the year isn't good? What if somebody dies? What if, what if the prayer doesn't get answered? What if the disease takes my life? What if every way that I would categorically call a year good, what if those things don't happen? Let me tell you something. Whether... God answers your prayer in this life or the life to come, it doesn't change the fact that he's good. And it doesn't change the fact that his plans for you are good. It's just that his ways are higher than our ways, that his plans are are higher than our plans. His understanding no man can comprehend. It's deeper than ours. But we know that because of his goodness, he's always working out something in us, no matter what happens to us. He's always working out something good in and through us. God will deliver on all his promises. And one of his promises is that he will crown the year with goodness. See, too many times you and I take a look at the crown and we say, well, if if it's good, then everything here should be good. If God is good, then nothing bad should happen in my year. Nothing bad should happen in my life. But it doesn't change the fact that even if bad things happen here, but Job says in Scripture, he says, though he slay me, still I praise him. Though he slay me, though bad things come my way, though difficulty comes my way, though I live in a broken world, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, still I will praise him. Why? Because he's good. And him crowning the year with goodness doesn't mean that only good things happen. It means that you have the opportunity, in whether you're walking through the valley or walking on the mountain, to give him the praise for being good. And to see his goodness even in life's difficulties. See, the promises of God in Scripture are not yes and no. It's not, oh, yes for you, but no for you. Or yes to this promise and no to that promise. No, no matter how many promises God has made, they are all yes in Christ. 
And when you and I partner with them, we say, amen, God said it, I believe it, now God will do it. God said it, I believe it, now God will do it. No matter how many promises are, they are yes in Christ. And so the amen comes out of me to the praise of God's glory. I'm not trying to teach you anything today. I'm not trying to give you any deep application. I just want to inspire your soul to hope again. To believe God again. To maybe shake yourself out of the complacency of modern day American Christianity that just says do this, this, and this and you'll feel better. That is not the Christian life. The Christian life is that God has given us his word. He's given us the full revelation of who Jesus Christ is. And back in the day when people believed that, they sold everything to follow after him. They gave up everything to pursue him. Why? Because the promises are yes. And it's the challenge, but the opportunity that we have as people that know Jesus. And have been called by him. And my prayer for you is that this year you will rise up. In your family, you will rise up in your church, you will rise up in your community, and you will lead with integrity. You will be the fragrance of Christ to those that are perishing. And that this whole thing that you and I have going on won't be about a church, but it will be about a group of people who look a whole lot like Jesus. And that has a major impact on the world around them. Will you stand up with me? Listen, our life circumstances will change. The, the things that you and I walk through will, will be maybe difficult. They may be, the year ahead may be uncertain. But this gospel of Jesus and his promises are constant. They are unquestionable and they are certain. And though this year, the, the body under this crown might, might shake and fear and tremble and, and get scared about situations that are happening. There may be moments where, where this person is tempted or where, where things don't feel good. But it, just because I'm fickle and just because my emotions and my heart betray me at times and they betray you at times doesn't change that which does not waver, which is the word of God that never fails which is the character of God that is faithful even when you're unfaithful, which is the goodness of God that's present even in the worst things in life. Just because we waver doesn't mean that he will. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And maybe there's somebody here and you're saying, Josh, I need delivered. Maybe there's a young person here and and you are trapped in sin, and it's hidden, nobody knows about it about, except you and Jesus. And you've hid it well. And you've learned how to kind of massage that sin and, and to keep it private. And you feel like you got it under control. Well, one day it will come out of the closet and kill you. It will reveal itself. And it will cost you something. And God, doesn't, God isn't content with giving his son that so, you, so that you could still live in bondage. Jesus died and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God is content when you have freedom in your life. There are people here today and in 2017 you lived under a cloud of depression and anxiety and fear and doubt and it, it guarded every decision you made. It guided everything that you said. You've not been motivated by the love of God. You've been motivated by guilt and by fear in your life. Jesus didn't die so that you could remain in bondage to guilt and fear. Jesus gave his life and rose again so that whom the Son sets free could be free indeed. And I believe that God is lifting the cloud and giving clarity to minds even now. Come on, if you're here today with every eye closed, every head bowed, if you're here today and in some way in your life you need God to deliver you or to deliver on a promise, would you lift a hand with me? Come on, it's in our surrender. It's, we lift hands because it's a sign of surrender. God, no longer my strength, no longer my ability. Because in our surrender, in our weakness, God is made strong. In our surrender, we actually find victory. It's counterintuitive to the world. If you're here today and you need God to deliver you from maybe sin or, or, or something that has 
been like the, the slingshot and it has held you back and you need God to deliver you, will you lift a hand if you're here and you know that God wants to deliver to somebody else through you and you've been kind of stepping back from taking that role in their life, will you lift a hand and say, God, will you deliver through me? If you know that God wants to use you as a greater way in the body of, in a greater way in the body of Christ or in this church and, and you've held back, but you know that this is your year of breakthrough. This is, I'm coming out of my shell. I'm coming out of, of cowering back, of sitting in the back row or on the sidelines. And I'm going to step forward and I'm going to be a blessing to my community. If that's you, would you lift a hand? Say, God, would you deliver on your promises in my life? Come on, collectively. Can we surrender to Jesus in this moment? Can we end 2017 saying, God, I surrender to your will. I surrender to you. Father, right now, I know that there, that there's people that have been hurting. There's hearts that have felt destroyed or downtrodden or hurt. And I speak right now, new life. God, over those that are hurting, those that are in dismay and disappointment and discouragement, Lord, we, we don't see it yet, but we know it's coming. That deliverer that's riding on the clouds, that in a moment, he will appear in our lives and he will deliver us. God, we, we watch for your coming, where you'll deliver from all sickness and disease and affliction. There are souls and there are people here today whose hearts have been like a barren land. They've been like a desert and it's been cracked and dry. You, you don't feel like God has done anything in your life. You haven't been able to receive from him recently, you need to lift your hands today and surrender to him because God is giving a new heart and a new spirit. He's letting new water rush forth into the places where the valley has been dry. Your life, you've been searching for answers through other religions, through relationships, and through people. And Jesus says, I'm the only one that can give the bread of life. I'm the only one that can give living water. Will you call on me to deliver you today? Jesus, we reach for you. We look for you. We long for you. And we ask that you'd fill this place with your presence and with your spirit. God, we are looking to you to deliver, not just in 2018, but right now in this moment. In Jesus' name. Come on, will you lift your hands and praise them together? We're so glad you joined us today. Our hope is that you're challenged and encouraged by these teachings every week. We'd love to hear how God is using this ministry to change lives. Send us an email at mystory@goevangel.org. For more information about our church, check us out online at goevangel.org.